All right, so now let's talk about septation of the chambers, the formation of the outflow tract. As the interventricular septum grows, it will eventually fuse with the aortico-pulmonary septum. So the IV septum will fuse with the aortico-pulmonary septum. Now, where did this aortico-pulmonary septum come from? So here is our forming heart tube. And if we cut through the cross sections of the this truncus up here, and then also of the bulbous cordis here, we can look and see that the descending aorticopulmonary septum will be formed by areas of endocardial tissue. So in this area up here, the truncal area, we can see that there is, if we look at the cross section, there will be little bulges of tissue like this. Also in the bulbous cordis region, we can see that there are little segments of tissue bulging out into the canal. And these will continue to grow into septations. So they'll grow towards midline and form a septum like this. And also like this in the bulbous cortis region. So the endocardial cushion tissue, these little bumps of tissue here and here and here and here in the shrunkel and the bulbous cortis regions, will grow to form septations so that the septum will grow in a spiraling fashion due to the growth of the endocardial tissue towards midline. And again, this occurs in a twisting motion all the way from the top here to the bottom of the bulbous cordis. It creates a new septum that divides this one trunk, like this, into two, and it spirals because of the growth of the different endocardial tissue in the truncus and bulbous cordis regions. Now, who is responsible for coordinating all of this? Neural crest cells. Now, let's bring them into the equation and review this quickly. So, neural crest cells interact with the proliferations of the endocardial tissue in the areas of the truncal and bulbar ridges. So, the neural crest cells are really important for the development of the aorticopulmonary septum. The 180 degree spiraling movement of the aorticopulmonary septum as it descends causes the truncus arteriosus to rotate. So there are a few things that can go wrong when we are forming the great vessels. Number one, we're talking about the failure of the AP septum to properly rotate. Not to properly form, but to properly rotate in its descent. This failure to properly rotate will lead to transposition of the great vessels. So the aorta will be connected incorrectly with the right ventricle, and the left ventricle will be incorrectly connected with the pulmonary trunk. So this is incorrect, and this is incorrect. How does an infant survive when the pulmonary and the systemic circulations are in two completely separated circuits like this? Well, there has to be some way for blood to mix. We need a VSD, a ASD, or a patent foramen ovale so that the blood can mix within these chambers because right now they are in two different circuits. Another problem that can happen is that we can have a anterior and lateral displacement of the septum. And this leads to tetralogy of Fallot shown in this diagram. This poor anterior and lateral placement creates a very stenotic opening to the pulmonary outflow tract. And this leads to the other components of the tetrad. Can you name the other components of the tetrad? So they're on this image, and it's going to help us visualize it. So this anterolateral displacement of the descending aorticopulmonary septum does not allow the closure of the interventricular septum. Remember, the AP septum has to come down and fuse with the interventricular septum. And this does not happen. What happens in result? We get a VSD. The stenotic opening creates a very high afterload. The right ventricle is going to have to work very hard to pump into this pulmonary trunk. So right to left shunning will occur because instead of pumping here, blood will flow preferentially through the VSD, like so. The flow arrow here tells us that blood will preferentially go through our VSD and into the systemic circulation because there is less resistance to go this way instead of into this stenotic pulmonary opening. 
And remember, eventually, this increased work by the right ventricle will lead to right ventricular hypertrophy. Why? Because the right ventricle chronically is going to be pumping against the stenotic opening to the pulmonary circulation. The overriding aorta refers to the aortic outflow tract sitting directly over the VSD. The third and last thing we need to talk about that can go wrong with our aorticopulmonary septum is complete failure of the aorticopulmonary septum to form within the truncus arteriosus. What does this create? A persistent truncus arteriosus. So one large truncus arteriosus, there was no septum that formed to separate these two, and we are left with one main trunk draining both the right and the left ventricles into one common trunk. Now let's go on to valve development. We have separated the atria and the ventricles, the truncus. Now we need to form four valves to separate the canals into different chambers. All valves form the same way. Endocardial cushion tissue lining the atrioventricular, aortic, and pulmonary tracts proliferate to form bulges into the canal. So here are the swellings of endocardial cushion tissue bulging into the flow tract of the blood. So these little bumps of tissue are endocardial cushion tissue. They will eventually form valves by breaking down and continuing to grow until eventually you just have projections of tissue like so. Now, this, all of the excess tissue degenerated and we only have these thin sheets of connected tissue left. And these will be our valves. The AV valves or atrioventricular valves form from tissue that is already surrounding the AV canals. And this is fused endocardial cushion tissue. What about the semilunar or aortic and pulmonary valves? These form from endocardial cushion tissue in the aortic and pulmonary outflow tracts. Pretty simple, right? Now, what happens if the valve fails to form? If the valve fails to form from this endocardial cushion wall tissue, you call the valve atretic. This literally means A is for without, and then tretic is a perforation, so without perforation. There is no perforation because there is no separation of the atrioventricular canal by a valve. So instead of separating this AV valve into two, this valve does not form, and we are just left with this. The one you will be responsible to know is tricuspid atresia. This poorly formed or atretic tricuspid valve did not adequately separate the right atrioventricular canal into a right atrium and right ventricle. There was no valve appropriately formed to do this. So what's left? The result is a very weak and tiny rudimentary right ventricle and a humongous left ventricle. Now, another problem with valve development that you need to know about is called Epstein anomaly. This is when apoptosis and separation of the valve from the endocardial cushion tissue that is part of the heart chamber did not occur completely. There is incomplete separation of the valve from this wall. So instead of this freely moving valve, it can be stuck or tapered down to the wall or the floor of the chamber. This failed separation of the tricuspid valve leads to Epstein anomaly. The tricuspid valve leaflets are tethered down to the myocardium of the right ventricle where they came from. They came from the endocardial cushion tissue lining the atrioventricular canal on the right side. So the term atrialized right ventricle is often used to describe this because it appears that the right atrium is extending all the way down into the right ventricle. The truth is that the valve leaflets just never completely separated and they got stuck. So it appears that the right ventricle is very small compared to the size of the right atrium. Fetal erythropoiesis. This is a high yield topic. Let me say that again. Super high yield. Gotta know this. Erythropoiesis begins in the third week of development when the first blood cells arise in the yolk sac. This site of blood formation is only temporary. By the sixth week, hematopoiesis also begins to take part in the liver. The liver continues to produce until birth 
there is some overlap between periods of erythropoiesis in different organs. So, there are two organs producing blood at the same time. Now, erythropoiesis occurs in the liver from six weeks until birth. But the spleen also contributes from weeks 10 to 28. When does the bone marrow finally get some action in this? The bone marrow kicks in from 18 weeks until adulthood. This should not be a huge surprise to you, considering that you have learned conditions in which defects in the production of hemoglobin in a particular patient will lead to the recruitment of additional areas that previously participated in erythropoiesis. So think back to your hematology section and name a disease that this occurs in. How about beta thalassemia? That's right. A defect in the beta globin gene occurs in beta thalassemia. Now, the body is going to respond by expanding erythropoiesis into the liver, the spleen, and other areas of the bone marrow, such as the skull. These kids have hepatosplenomegaly because of the increased activity and erythropoiesis of the liver and the spleen. This makes sense because these two organs previously participated in this process in the fetus. So not only is fetal blood produced in different places than in adults, but it is also hemoglobin that is composed of different subunits. Now, fetal hemoglobin is alpha-2, gamma-2, while adult hemoglobin is alpha-2, beta-2. Note here on the graph how the production of alpha chains increases then plateaus. This is because alpha is always part of the hemoglobin tetramer. Now what about embryonic hemoglobin? Embryonic hemoglobin is composed of a gamma or alpha globin combined with either one of the two embryonic globins. So globins make up hemoglobin. The two embryonic globins are epsilon or zeta. They are made by the yolk sac until the liver and spleen can come in and help us out. Why do the hemoglobins change from embryonic to fetal to adult? One reason for everything, right? It's oxygen binding capacity. Now, fetal hemoglobin needs to have a higher oxygen binding capacity. Why? Because the baby has to steal it from the mom, right? Has to take that oxygen off of the mother's hemoglobin and take it for its own. So fetal hemoglobin needs to have a higher oxygen affinity so it can pull oxygen from the maternal blood in the placental villi. Now something very, very high yield for you guys to know is how fetal hemoglobin is bound much less avidly by 2,3-bis-phosphoglycerate, so 2,3-BPG. So 2,3-BPG is very good at binding adult hemoglobin, not so much for fetal hemoglobin. So remember back to your biochemistry, what is 2,3-BPG and when do we produce it? So 2,3-BPG is a byproduct of glycolysis. Cells make a ton of 2,3-BPG when they have kicked into anaerobic metabolism. Now how does that relate to what you need to know about hemoglobin's oxygen affinity? So what 2,3-BPG does is it sits right here in this central cavity. It creates a link between these two beta chains of deoxyhemoglobin. So when hemoglobin is not bound by oxygen, we call it deoxyhemoglobin. 2,3-BPG binds and creates a link between these two beta chains and it stabilizes deoxyhemoglobin. The ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen will be very limited because we've stabilized the deoxy form. This makes a lot of sense, right? Because if cells are producing a lot of 2,3-BPG because of their anaerobic metabolism, such as glycolysis, we don't want to steal oxygen from our tissues. We want deoxyhemoglobin to be the main type of hemoglobin in the blood so that oxygen is going to be released into the tissues that need it, the anaerobic ones that are producing all of this 2,3-BPG. Fetal hemoglobin utilizes this and has a very low binding capacity for 2,3-BPG so that it is very able to bind oxygen. It can take away oxygen from the maternal hemoglobin that 
is more sensitive to 2,3 BPG. This is what examiners like to do, and you will see a question about hemoglobin in some way on your step exam. Now we move on to another incredibly high yield topic, fetal circulation. We're going to walk through this diagram of fetal circulation and focus on the direction of blood flow in utero versus after birth. Important fact number one is that the highest oxygen saturation, around 80%, is going to be in the umbilical vein. The umbilical vein is going to be transporting newly oxygenated blood from the placenta. Even though it has highly oxygenated blood, it's called a vein because it's on the way to the right side of the heart. The blood in the umbilical vein has two options. It can either supply or bypass the liver. So one third of the blood will join the portal vein and enter the liver. So here's our portal vein. Portal vein will be joined by the umbilical vein and the hepatocytes will receive oxygen and nutrients. Now the other portion the other two-thirds will bypass the liver via the ductus venosus. The ductus venosus connects to the inferior vena cava. You can see it joins, here's the inferior cava, and it bypasses the liver completely. The deoxygenated blood that leaves the hepatic sinusoids will rejoin the oxygenated blood that bypasses the liver via the ductus. So everything is back here together. The inferior vena cava will dump oxygenated blood into the right atrium, this way. Do you see this arrow showing the vector of blood flow? There's actually a small piece of tissue sitting in the right atrium that guides blood flowing from the IVC to the foramen ovale so that it can go from the right atrium into the left atrium. This blood needs to enter the aorta so it can feed the great vessels up here. The gray vessels supply the most important organ, the brain. So why are all of these flow arrows necessary on this diagram? The blood in the superior vena cava returns blood from the head and upper extremity. It is very low in oxygen content because it is venous blood coming back from tissues that used up all the oxygen. It is especially low compared to the blood that is coming from the ductus venosus and also from the portal vein, from the inferior side of the heart. We don't want this low oxygen blood to mix with this high oxygen blood as much as possible. So these flow arrows actually are quite helpful in preventing this mixing. We need to be able to direct where these two types of blood go. Now where will the blood that is very low in oxygen in the superior vena cava go? It will come down and take this little flow area. Do you see? Coming down and it enters into the right ventricle. This low oxygen tension blood will then be pumped into the pulmonary trunk and some will squeeze into the lungs because it's a very high resistant circuit, but the lungs still need a little bit of blood. This makes a lot of sense because the lungs are full with fluid and do not participate in oxygen exchange, but they still need some blood because they are a developing organ. Now where's the rest of this low oxygen tension blood going to go? it is going to be shunted across the ductus arteriosus. Notice how the ductus receives most of this low oxygen tension blood after the great vessels. This is because the ductus's job is to serve as a shunt so that this low oxygen tension blood does not go to the brain. The shunt is after the great vessels so that the blood will come down into the aorta. When it's in the aorta, it can now be returned back to the umbilical arteries to the placenta. So again, let's review. The shunt is to take this low oxygen blood from the superior vena cava, pass the great vessels into the ductus, into the aorta, all the way down into the umbilical arteries, and then we go to the placenta to get more oxygen. Super high yield here. What happens at birth when the baby is separated from the placenta? and the baby takes in a fresh breath of oxygen. So this image shows us some of the hemodynamic changes when the baby separated from the placenta and starts breathing fresh oxygen. This increased oxygen tension in the lungs causes a ton of vasodilatation. So the resistance goes from very high to very, very low. Remember, the lung is the only organ that has vasoconstriction in settings of low oxygen levels.
So in high oxygen levels, it loves it and opens up all of the vessels. Now, cutting the cord leads to a huge decrease in prostaglandin E2. The placenta was producing tons of this. Now that we've separated the baby from the placenta, there is very, very low levels of PGE2 circulating. Remember that prostaglandins E2 and E1 cause smooth muscle relaxation. So without any more PGE2 or PGE1 around, there's no more smooth muscle relaxation. Now what structures with lots of smooth muscle will now contract? The uterus and the ductus, arteriosus. The absence of PGE2, because we separated the baby from the placenta, will cause the ductus to close and the uterus to contract down on itself. This helps limit postpartum bleeding. And also, it aids the ductus arteriosus to contract on itself, and if we close it off, we are left with a remnant called the ligamentum arteriosum. Now, what would you do if for some reason the ductus did not close and we did not get our remnant? We need a drug that will inhibit the production of PGE1 and PGE2. We need a drug that will inhibit cyclooxygenase because we want less prostaglandins circulating. So go ahead and tell me the drug that you would use to close a patent ductus arteriosus. Number one, you need an NSAID because we know we need to inhibit this enzyme. Your step one exam will never say something as general as an NSAID. It will either ask you for a mechanism of action or a specific drug as the answer of choice. In this situation, we give endomethacin. This is the type of NSAID used for the closure of a patent ductus arteriosus.